you guys. Welcome back to Flickers of Fear. We're talking about another Giallo movie today. I know how much you guys enjoyed Giallo July and I enjoyed uh, watching all the movies and making them. But as I said on there, I probably, I was going to keep sprinkling Giallo movies throughout the other months too. I probably will do another whole like Giallo month at some point uh, in the future as well. But you know, every now and then I'm gonna be thrown in a Giallo movie because I like them and there's like a lot that I haven't covered, uh, including this one that we're talking about today. So Sergio Martino, we've talked about him before uh, several times, matter of fact. Uh, he's actually a name that anybody with even like a passing familiarity uh, with Giallo films should probably know already. Now, he made a bunch of different movies in a bunch of different genres, but in the two years between 1971 and 1973, he actually directed five really, really iconic examples of uh, the genre, all of which are fantastic. And I think, if, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, four of them that I've already covered on here. Uh, they were The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, uh, your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, All the Colors of the Dark, Torso, and the one that we're going to be talking about today. So if I have covered those other four, then this will make like his big five, you know what I mean? Like I said, he did do some other movies like later on, but these are kind of the ones that he's best known for. So this movie is called The Case of the Scorpion's Tail, and it came out in 1971. And this was actually the second movie that he directed in this, you know, uh, incredible run of five that he had. And it's a very, um, I had actually seen it before, and then I watched it again, like for this video, and I actually really liked it much better the second time. It's very, um, I, I really admired like the script a lot more. It's very tightly plotted, it's very entertaining, and it has like some really cool like cinematography, like some really nice shots, um, has a really good script with like a lot of really surprising twists and turns, and has some really, really satisfyingly grisly kills, which I kind of feel like his other ones, I mean, I guess his other ones were kind of gory too, but I mean, this one has like some really, <laughs> Some ones where I was like watching it, I was like, holy shit, like I forgot. Yeah, so this one has like some pretty fucked up uh, murders in it too. So at the beginning of the movie, we're introduced to this beautiful icy blonde woman named Lisa Baumer. Now she's played by Evelyn Stewart, which I believe is the pseudonym of the actress uh, Ida Galli, who I think is Italian. Now this woman is like the two-timing wife of this jet-setting rich dude named Kurt Baumer. Now, as I said, at the beginning of the movie, uh, Lisa is busily banging her little scruffy side piece that she has going on there. And she gets a phone call. I mean, basically she's like on the phone being like, yeah, he's leaving on the flight today. Yeah, come on over. Like it's that kind of thing. So, uh, so while they're in bed, it, like the phone wakes them up in the middle of the night. But this phone call that she gets actually informs her that her presumably Lego-sized husband <laughs> has been killed in a plane crash. If you've seen the movie and you've seen the effect of like the plane, you'll probably know what I'm talking about, like why I make that joke, because the plane is just kind of like, they show it, like they intercut like her on the phone. Well, actually they intercut her like having sex with her boyfriend and they then they intercut like her talking on the phone with this pretty clearly like toy plane that's like against this black backdrop with like a real moon in the back. It's like kind of like a composite shot. And it's like, it really made me laugh like the first time I saw it because I was just kind of like, how did he fit in that little bitty model plane? <laughs> And then, yeah, so then, like, it blows up. So, uh, so yeah, so he's presumably been killed uh, in this tiny uh, toy plane explosion. Now, uh, she gets this news, and she's basically like, oh, yeah, um, I know all about that plane. Oh, I mean, uh, oh, man, what a shame that is. Uh, I loved that guy more than life itself. Yes, indeedy. Yes, I did. Now, uh, so after this whole situation, helping her through her terrible grief at the loss of her husband, loss of her husband, is the fact that uh, poor old exploded Kurt had an insurance policy that will make Lisa a million dollars richer 
All she has to do is fly to Athens, Greece, to pick up the check in person and cha-ching, like now she's a rich lady. Now she tells the head of the insurance firm that held the policy that her and Kurt were pretty much like all but separated, like they lived kind of separate lives, and that she legit for real had no idea that she was the beneficiary of such largesse, she tries to say. But Mr. Insurance Man is not buying it. Now, since the company suspects that maybe Lisa had something to do with the little model plane explosion that <laughs> shuffled off Kurt's mortal coil, they decide they're gonna hire crack insurance investigator and rakishly suave motherfucker Peter Lynch, who's played by George Hilton, who's in a fuck ton of Giallo movies and in a fuck ton of Sergio Martino movies as well. Uh, so they hire him to follow Lisa's little tight ass around and see what dubious shit uh, she might be up to. Now, because he's not being real subtle about the whole following thing, I mean, basically she goes to check into the hotel and he's standing right there like staring at her like really creepily and then follows her to the elevator. It's just, it's a whole thing. And I'm just kind of like, I'm like, can't you like tone it down a little bit? It's like, she's gonna know that you're following her, bro. So uh, presumably, yeah, it's just like, so he approaches her at dinner. Hey, can I sit at you, sit with you or whatever? And she was like, might as well. You've been crawling at my fucking grill all day long. And uh, yeah, so she even knows like who he is. Like she knows his name. She knows like he's from the insurance company. She's like, yeah, you guys think I had something to do with my husband dying and you're following me around. I get it. You know, there's that. Uh, so she's got that going on, but uh, as it turns out, she's not really all that worried about Peter Lynch following her around because she's got bigger problems to deal with. Another thing that's going on is that Kurt, her presumably exploded husband, uh, had this very severe looking mistress named Lara. And Lara and has this like lawyer, she calls him the lawyer, but he also looks like the, the muscle, you know what I mean? So he's like lawyer slash one man brute squad. Uh, and his name is Sharif. And the two of them want to get their hands on some of Kurt's sweet death cash as well, because Lara is just kind of like, hey, I'm the mistress and I deserve half of that shit. Like he was gonna change the will anyway. That's why you killed him, blah, blah. Now, it turns out that they've already murdered Lisa's former boyfriend back in London, who was like a heroin addict, and he was actually trying to blackmail her with a letter in which he, like, she didn't say, hey, I'm going to kill my husband or anything like that, but she did say something about, like, getting rid of him or something that sounded, like, a little bit suspicious. And so they were, like, um, yeah, so they went to his apartment and killed him, and then, uh, then they got hold of the letter. And now they're kind of, like, admittedly, they're whole like scheme they're trying to blackmail her too they're basically like hey we want half the money um and she's like yeah no um because you know what i mean it's a million dollars and uh so she doesn't really uh buckle under their little threats or whatever and so they proceed to try to kill her like she just like takes off and they're just like oh shit we didn't think she would actually like you know run away so they <laughs> like chase after her and they try to stab her and shit like that now, Peter Lynch, the insurance investigator who's been following her around because he was following her around, um, he saw this whole sh uh, shenanigans take place. So he actually manages to save her from getting stabbed by them. But as it turns out, her troubles are just beginning. Now, because she plans on getting this million dollars as quickly as possible and getting the fuck out of Dodge, probably a good idea uh, in this situation, Lisa cashes her million dollar check and makes arrangements to fly to Tokyo that night, like to meet up with her lover. So she calls for a cab. She's gonna take a flight out at 9 p.m. or whatever. Unfortunately though, for her, uh, the security at the hotel she's staying at doesn't really seem all that up to snuff because somebody breaks into her room and uh, basically slices her to ribbons. This is another example of, this was the kind of the first plot twist, twist that surprises me because you think you're gonna be following Lisa the whole time because she's like the main character, but literally I think it's like 25 minutes in, like maybe, uh, she gets fucking murdered. So you're just kind of like, oh, okay, we're doing this. We're doing a psycho type of situation. I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. But yeah, so she gets killed like pretty much right away. And somebody steals the little, uh, the little suitcase that she had all of the money bundles in. 
Now, as I said, since Peter has been following Lisa around, uh, the cops suspect that he either killed her or he knows more about her murder than he's letting on. Now, he says, look, bros, I was just following her for work. Like, they thought that maybe she had something to do with the death of her husband and, like, the insurance company. And they call the insurance company. It all checks out. They're like, oh, yeah, you are here on a job. But they still kind of think he's suspicious anyway. So, you know, they kind of, like, are crawling up his ass like the whole fucking movie. Now, he does actually tell them about Lara and Sharif. And so they're like, okay, well, they find out about that, too, at kind of at the same time. And they go to Lara's apartment to interview her about, hey, did you kill Lisa? And while literally while the cop is in there, and I think it's like the middle of the day, too. I'm not really sure because it's inside. But the cop is like inside interviewing Lara and Peter is like hanging out out in the hallway. And somebody like legit tries to kill him like with a hatchet right in the fucking hall, like right in front of our apartment. Like, while well, the cop is like right inside. I was like, wow, that's a bold move to say the least. Just right out there in the hallway. You find out why later on. But yeah. So then after that, you kind of have your state standard giallo murder mystery happening you got your kind of world weary shit talking investigators you got a little bit of a budding love story between peter and this other woman named cleo who's played by anita strindberg uh she's actually like a journalist that's been assigned to the case she's a journalist or a photographer i can't remember and uh so she kind of so they kind of like become entangled and that's a whole thing and there's just like a whole fisherman's platter of red herrings as there usually are in this one uh you know people who are at first suspected of the murders like for example lara and sharif they turn up dead themselves so you're like hmm who could it be now uh and it becomes clear like as it goes on that whatever it is that's happening like this plot that's unfolding is way more complicated than it seemed at first blush and matter of fact i'm like glad that i watched it the second time because i think the first time I was just kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Because the plot's like a little bit, it's a little bit convoluted. But if you pay attention, like it actually absolutely does make sense. So what, I mean, what you're trying to find out is who is bumping off all of these seemingly unrelated people. Like some of the people at first that get killed, everybody's like, oh, it has to do with Kurt Baumer and the exploded plane and like the wife trying to get the insurance payout. But then like other people start getting killed too. And they're like, what the fuck? They, that person didn't seem to have anything to do with that whole situation so they don't really know like what connects them all and there's also like like i said there's some other red herrings there's like this real sketchy like interpol uh officer supposedly that comes there to work on the investigation and uh you know he has like an injured hand at some point when you know there was a woman that like bit the hand of the killer there's all this other kind of stuff then for a while they're thinking well maybe kurt baumer like isn't really dead like maybe he faked his death like to collect on his own insurance policy was him and his wife in on it and then he decided to bump her off and keep all the money for himself so it's like there's all these different like possibilities that are kind of like floating around and you're not really sure like which way it's gonna go you know and or it could be something totally different like it could be just something way more sinister way more convoluted like i said this is just pretty convoluted and you really actually do have to pay attention to the end where everything's kind of explained because i think i missed like some of the details like on the last well, on the first watch but on the second one i was kind of like oh okay Okay, I gotcha. It absolutely does make sense. So don't worry about that. I have to say too, like apropos of nothing, there's a scene in this one and it kind of highlighted something that happens a lot in Giallo movies. And I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I probably have. But why on earth do female characters in Giallo movies, not every single one, but I've seen it enough times for me to like remember it and like remark upon it. Every single female character, she just kind of like stands there helplessly and stares at the door while the murderer is busting it down. It's like, you know, ladies, you can run away, perhaps, or you can, like, find a weapon and fight back. Perhaps that's another option that you have available to you. I don't really know, like, <laughs> it's really weird. It almost kind of seems like, you know, just because a dude goes to the trouble of breaking into your house, that doesn't really mean that you have some kind of obligation to him to like allow him to kill you you could like fight back or like climb out the window or some shit they never do though they just kind of like stand there against the window going oh shit and i'm like dude there's a window right there or it's like you know there's a whole kitchen full of knives like please you had time like you had time to like formulate a plan 
<laughs> please like make but yeah it happens in this one and it just kind of like made me laugh so it's just kind of like stood out because i've seen it in other films as well and it's not i mean to be fair it's not just giallo movies i've seen it in other older horror movies just in general where women would just kind of like here comes the killer and they're like oh no when they could just like run to the side or something like that they're just like well I guess I just have to stay here and get killed. That's just how it goes, because I'm a lady in a horror movie. I don't know how to run away or, like, fight back or anything like that. But I don't know. I just thought that was funny. Because there was a scene like that in this one, and it just kind of, like, reminded me of the whole thing. So, uh, so yeah. So the mystery, like I said, is very, very complicated. Um, well, I don't know if it's that complicated, but it's it's fairly complicated. You know what I mean? But uh, the key to the whole uh, cannoli, as it were, uh, turns out to be this uh, filigreed, like, gold cufflink which is in the shape of a scorpion, which gets found in Cleo's apartment after a dude breaks in and tries like unsuccessfully to kill her. So hence the name of the movie being the case of the scorpion's tail. There is actually something having to do with the scorpion. It's a cuff length that looks like a scorpion. Oh, and I should say too that Sergio Martino also did another giallo movie that was called the scorpion with two tails that came out in 1982 but i'm pretty sure i've seen it but it was a long time ago and i don't think it has anything to do with this one like it's not a sequel or anything like that so i'd say this one there's actually like some really good misdirection uh as to who the actual killer is and i'm not going to spoil the ending but i will say that this movie kind of has a real enjoyable subversion of some of the more common tropes of the genre, which I uh, quite, uh, which I quite liked. There's also, um, as I mentioned, some added spice in there. With well, like, there's some really, really graphic kills, particularly one guy that gets killed uh, by having his eye gouged out by a like a piece of a broken bottle. It's pretty nasty. Like I'm sitting there going, "Holy crap!" Like Lucio Fulci to the white courtesy phone. You know, what I mean? it was that kind of thing. I had forgotten that that fucking scene was in there. I was like, God damn, that was like, that was fucked up. You know, I mean, Giallo movies in general, they do usually like have pretty bloody kills, but this one had like some pretty bloody kills even because I've seen some Giallo movies that were just kind of like, oh, stab and that's it. But that eye gouging was uh, something else. Yeah, I had forgotten all about that. And, uh, you know, there's your standard kind of Giallo movie nudity. You got some hotties in there and they have like some cool outfits and there's some cool interiors and shit like that. Uh, but yeah, this is a pretty great entertaining giallo movie with uh you know enough plot curveballs to kind of keep you guessing and it's definitely like a stellar example of the form and it's like amazing that these five movies came out within you know two years and you know they're still remembered to this day as being like really good examples of it and sergio martino like did all of them in that in that short of a time span so that's pretty awesome so if you've seen the case of the scorpion's tale what did you think about it um or does it sound like interesting enough for you to want to see it's actually on tubi for free at the moment uh, as, at least as of this recording, if you'd like to watch it. So tell me your thoughts about it in the comments, and I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.